Right, I would like to start the last session of today's event, the policy panel. Um, the United States played a pivotal role in building a democracy in South Korea. The mutual defense treaty between the United States and South Korea serves to protect the South Korean democracy to this day. It is with special excitement that I'm pleased to welcome to this panel two experts in US policy with not only academic, but also first-hand practical experience in Korean affairs, as both of them served as diplomats in Korea. Our principal speaker, Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, has four decades of experience in Korea, which started with her work as a Peace Corps volunteer in the 1970s. She witnessed Korea's democratization movement through the 1970s as a peaceful corps volunteer and in the 1980s as internal, internal political unit chief at the U.S. Embassy in Seoul and principal officer at the U.S. Consulate in Busan. She then returned to Seoul as U.S. Ambassador to South Korea in, tw in 2008 through 2011. Her diplomatic career also includes serving as acting Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. Ambassador Kathleen Stevens also served in China, India, Northern Ireland, and the Balkans. She is currently the William J. Perry Fellow in the Career Program at the Walter H. Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. The moderator of this policy discussion, Lee Feinstein, is the founding dean and professor of international studies here at the School of Global and International Studies at Indiana University. Prior to joining this school, he served on the presidential transition team for President Obama as U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Poland and as a principal deputy director of the policy planning staff. Dean Feinstein was a senior fellow and is currently a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He is the author of Means to an End, U.S. Interest and the International Criminal Court, and was appointed by President Obama as a trustee of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Dean Feinstein was the Secretary of State's advisor on nonproliferation in the policy planning staff and took part in Secretary Albright's negotiations on North Korea's nuclear program. In this panel, we will hear about their experiences and perspectives on Korean democratization, about the effect of the Korean division and North Korean threat on South Korea's democracy, as well as the U.S. role in these issues. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Kathleen Stevens and Dean Lee Feinstein. Well, welcome to SGIS. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Dr. Che, thank you very much for th those introductions, and we're really thrilled to have you at the school. And uh, congratulations to Pref Professor Kim, who is in the back, um, to uh, all of the speakers and to all of those in attendance for a very enriching uh, day. And I, I just need to say that on behalf of SGIS and the university, we're extremely proud of the Institute for Korean Studies uh, and its leadership and team. Uh, and uh, we're also very proud of um, uh, our Department of East Asian Languages and, and Cultures, which for more than half a century has been one of the nation's leading uh, departments uh, in the field and which continues to grow uh, and thrive um, in the school. And I, I want as well to thank, uh, as Professor Kim did, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Lee Se-ung for uh, uh, making this uh, conference possible. So Ambassador Stevens, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for flying across the country or halfway. In any case, uh, we had the privilege of working uh, together and kind of around one another at different points in the State Department. We also overlapped as ambassadors, although on different continents. Um, uh, Ambassador Stevens is that Foreign Service officer who has very, very broad uh, and deep foreign policy experience in many different geographies, but also is a three-timer uh, in Korea. Uh, and in my own experience, uh, those who come back with the deep uh, language uh, experience as well as uh, um, cultural uh, affinity and understanding really have a, a, a leg up 
And I should just to clarify, um, Ambassador Stevens' first time was uh, not as a U.S. Foreign Service officer, but as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, so um, let's start with the subject of today's conference. Uh, democracy is under challenge worldwide, mm -hmm. uh, in Europe and Latin America and in East Asia. And it needs to be said, um, we're facing our own challenges here in the United States too. There's a, there's a, a piece that uh, I bet you have seen as well, which has got a lot of attention around here in the Journal of Democracy last mm -hmm. summer, which uh, talked about the fact that support for democracy as a form of government is low mm -hmm. among millennials. Mm -hmm. That would be most of you. Um, and not just in North America, but, but worldwide. So um, as I said, we're not without our own challenges here as well. But the question before us is the state of democracy in South Korea. There have been a range of viewpoints expressed today. How do you see it? Well, thank you. First of all, I also have to add my thanks, first of all, to you, Dean Feinstein, for your very warm welcome. It's great to see you here. I uh, had read about the Institute, of course, uh, about the, uh, uh, the Center for uh, Korean Studies. I don't have the names right, perhaps. Uh, but I congratulate uh, uh, especially the Center for its first year anniversary and congratulate you on what you're building here. Um, I've already told you this, but I, I confess, I have to say, I, I hadn't been to Bloomington before, but one of my favorite movies is a movie called Breaking Away. And I actually uh, chose it as the, the movie to watch, not knowing I would be here years later, with a group of Korean students while I was ambassador. Uh, one, because I love the movie. Uh, it's about cycling, which I love, and I did a lot of in Korea with a lot of Koreans. That's one way of breaking down certain barriers, I guess. And, uh, uh, but also because it was about finding yourself. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, a continuing story between the United States and Korea. I can say it. Anyway, it's a delight to be here, and I thank everyone for their warm welcome. Uh, I, like others in this room, and I've really enjoyed all the presentations today and the comments, uh, but maybe simply because we're the same generation, a little bit like Professor Cummings. I mean, I've been, I think, a witness to, and, and if I may say maybe in a small way, I felt I've been a participant in, in Korea's, and especially South Korea's, uh, extraordinary journey over the past 40 odd years. And of course, this is a journey for, uh, for, for good or ill, be, for better or worse, <laughs> um, that the US has been uh, uh, deeply involved in. Uh, and at, at times, I've also been a part of, of participated in that sense. But when it comes to thinking about Korea's democracy, to finally get to your question, I guess, and I know we're going to talk about it at some length, uh, this to me really is one of the still almost uh, uh, less understood and most important stories of Korea's modern journey. Uh, and I, I appreciate uh, starting off this morning with uh, Professor Cummings' lecture, where I think uh, he, he did uh, refer to the, uh, uh, agree with the assessment that uh, uh, Korea's democratization is one of the most kind of extraordinary, I think, success stories in terms of rapid. I, I don't want to paraphrase you too much, but it's a great success, and I think it's regarded that way. I think it's also very important, as all of our speakers have, to put that in the context of what's been um, a very, very challenging, challenging road at times, and what remains, uh, as it does in this country, uh, a journey which is unfinished. Uh, I first went to Korea, if I can put it in somewhat personal terms, in, in the 1970s, as you noted, at a time when Park Jong-hee was still president. Uh, the first lady had just been assassinated in an attempt that was aimed at, at her husband. Uh, Yushin Constitution was, was, was in place. And so I did live in an authoritarian Korea, in the countryside. And actually, at that time, most of us were sent to the countryside because certainly universities were, were, were too politicized in some ways for innocent young Peace Corps volunteers to get too involved. But uh, it was a time of, uh, and I could talk more about that. I mean, certainly, in, again, in a very selfish way, I was frustrated when I couldn't get a Time magazine that had pages ripped out. And things blacked out, not only if they were critical of the South Korean government, but if they said anything that seemed slightly positive about uh, uh, the, what we used to call the, the, the block, right? The communist block, or communism, or socialism. So, uh, you know, one felt the constraints, and one also, I, and I felt, uh, Korea was changing rapidly, and one thing that hasn't been mentioned today, of course, is, is this is a, Korea's journey is also about its extraordinary economic rise. Uh, it happened very fast. 
Uh, but at the time in the 70s when I was there, you could see people's lives changing. And while even at a time when one did not express, certainly in the circles, if I can say I moved in, uh, uh, at first meeting, uh, much in the way of political views, uh, Koreans understood, educated then, that they didn't have a democracy and that's what they'd been promised and they wanted it. Uh, and I went back to Korea then in the 80s and worked in the embassy. And uh, here I will have to say that, uh, I'm answering the question a little longer, that uh, my experience, and I'm sorry, Bruce, you didn't get a visa then. That was a wrong thing. I was there from 83 to 89. Uh, a lot of Koreans couldn't travel then. So, uh, uh, but uh, at that time, uh, I, my job was to kind of figure out what was going on politically. And I came back to a Korea just a few years after I'd lived there as a Peace Corps volunteer, obviously in a different role, but radically changed. Park Chung-hee had been assassinated. We'd had the, the, the spring of 1980, Chun Doo-wan, things that were talked about this morning, and people were angry, and my job was to try to understand that. And I think we can talk more about it, but that experience then of seeing over a, in a relatively short period, and it happened you know, over a number of years, uh, but what culminated in a decision, not the final decision, the final say on, on Korean democracy, but an irreversible, we've seen decision to uh, have a direct election, have a direct election. People joined in the streets, and at this point, it wasn't only those who were part of the resistance, it was the people working in the shops, those who had stayed back, uh, those in more, if you like, more conservative political circles who said, here's something we think we're ready for. I mean, and we, we not just ready for it, we want now, and that is to elect our president with our own hands. That was something everybody agreed to. And the Constitution that was then written in short order and, uh, uh, and, is, and, and the first, uh, with the opposition split, though, an uh, election held, and Koreans did elect the president with their own hands and proceeded to do that every five years afterwards. So I think that Korean democracy has had a lot of ups and downs, which we can talk about. Uh, it has, over the last, since 1987, so now for 30 years, 30 years this year, every five years, uh, power has transferred peacefully uh, from one side at times of the political spectrum to the other. And it has happened peacefully, and Korea's economy has continued to, for the most part, grow and prosper, and Korea has continued to uh, grow in its ability not only to uh, uh, live in security, but to play a, a responsible and growing role in the global community. That's, that's, and to be an example to other countries in many ways including in some of the challenges it's faced. And we've talked about some of those today. I think we'll talk about the, them some more. Well, thank you very much. I'll, I want to talk in a bit about um, how to think about the US uh, role, such as it was, and all of this. But before that, we could just dig a little bit deeper about um, how you evaluate uh, the, the, the strength and challenges to Korean mm -hmm. democracy now. There's some earlier conversation by Professor Cummings about some of mm -hmm. the laws that restrict access to um, uh, certain kinds of information and some national, national security, security laws. law. And, uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, uh, but I wonder also if we could talk about other other issues. Uh, for example, um, how does how do um, how does the economic circumstance in Korea and perceptions of uh, inequality uh, mm -hmm. uh, affect mm -hmm. um, Korean democracy? Well, I'd love to hear some of our panelists on that and others in the audience as well, but. Uh, I'd answer this way, and again, I, I, I have to do my sort of uh, disclaimer here. I'm not a scholar. I'm a, I'm a dilettante. You put it nicely, but that's uh, and I've but I've watched this journey over time. And going back to Korea, uh, uh, in the uh, mid noughts I guess we call them, I went back to Korea after having having left in 1989 and going to a post Cold War Europe for about 15 years. And going back in uh, 2005 uh, from the State Department, actually meeting, I have to shout out to Mark Minton, who was our charge d'affaires at the embassy at that time. And I think Mark will remember, I was kind of like, you know, Rip Van Winkle about a lot of things. I uh, hadn't been there. Obviously, I'd followed things, but uh, Nomi Hyun was president. And I remember meeting with some students, for example, and, and asking them uh, uh, I mean, uh, about how they saw their democracy. Uh, I'd been away so long. I was eager. I'd, I'd left, as I said, just, uh, just after the Olympics and the Seoul Olympics, and when there was a sense that Korea was going to move forward with this democracy, although it a long way uh, uh, remained to go. And I actually asked them, I said, do you ever worry about the military interfering in, 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 the, in the politics? And they looked at me as if I was absolutely out of my mind. They really did. Um, and that told me something. It told me the time, time, times had changed. Um, 
but uh, so I think that one of the strengths, as I kind of mentioned earlier, is that uh, uh, sort of inexorably, the, uh, there's been peaceful transfers of power for uh, more than a generation. And that, that's not a low bar in, in the world, as you know from your own experience. That's, a, that's a, a, an important bar. And, and, the, um, and, and, and the country has continued to function. Uh, and gradually, and not, not even so gradually, I think there has been greater freedom of expression, freedom of speech. We've heard some great examples about that here today. Uh, and what we've also seen, and this I, I feel a little bit envious of as an American, and, and uh, uh, but was gladdened to see as a friend of Korean democracy, is if you like, maybe unlike what we hear sometimes about millennials in certain countries, including our own, um, not only in the candlelight, uh, uh, these extraordinary uh, gatherings, uh, uh, candlelight vigils, demonstrations, uh, protests of, uh, of the last year, but uh, in 2010, someone mentioned, I think, rightly, by-elections and National Assembly elections. I was there in, in 2010 for a by-election that happened right after the sinking of the Chonan, when, when, when the ruling party, the, uh, 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 the party of the Lee Myung-bak, thought, thought that they were going to probably benefit from, from the increased security tensions. And, um, and, and it actually backfired because, as political politicians sometimes do, they overplayed their hand in my view, so, and, uh, and, and people came out to vote. Young people came out to vote. Uh, I actually wrote a blog about it while I was there, and I, I got questioned about it a little bit, but not in a negative way. I wrote, I wrote a blog saying a good election. Actually, the government didn't do so well in a good election. I started off by saying, I'm not saying who, who should win, but what was really good was to see young people say, uh, and text on their still new smartphones, <laughs> um, you gotta vote, you gotta vote, you gotta vote. And I felt the same way about, about this massive outpouring, which I also was there for in November for a couple of those beautiful Saturdays. I got there before it got too cold. And, uh, and seeing people out. Uh, you know, as an American, I had some questions. This gets to, I guess, some of the questions I have about what happened. But I, but I think the commitment to, to strengthening Korea's democracy to making things better uh, is something that uh, was harnessed then and needs to continue uh, to be harnessed. Um, as still an outsider, I'm, uh, I, even having seen and watched and been in Korea for so long, and uh, I sometimes ask people, I said, you know, um, here we're in the fifth year of a presidency. You know you're going to have an election in 2017. Uh, as several have pointed out, uh, the political parties, nobody's really behind like getting rid of President Park now. If this were the United States, you know, we Americans, we always say, if this were the United States and we were less than a year from an election, uh, we'd be taking all this anger and political energy, well, at least I hope we would, <laughs> maybe we'll <laughs> get to that, that too, and figuring out who's going to be the candidate in the next election and doing that. It's just a few months away. Uh, why are you on the streets, I didn't say it in a, but just in a curious way, saying, she must go now. She must go now. And I think this gets to some kind of, and again, I have experts here, kind of deep cultural and historical points and differences. So she's lost our trust, right, our minchim, kind of the mandate of heaven. And she's got to go now. But I think there is a question, and I'm not a political scientist either, where does this take, having, having achieved this peaceful, again, yet another peaceful transfer of power under the most challenging of circumstances, I mean, to have an election one day and the president start the next, I mean, that alone in a presidential system, not a parliamentary system, is mind-boggling. I mean, we would never pull that off here. Um, but you did it. Uh, Korea did it. And, but where does that leave sort of the sense of the institutions? Uh, there's been talk ever since the 1987 election, and obviously before, some of the pictures actually had, had said, if, for those of you in Korean, uh, you know, amend the Constitution. That's been a part of every demonstration for, you know, since, well, I mean, the 40s, I guess. Uh, but there's talk on both sides or on all sides of the political spectrum that this one-term, one uh, five-year presidency, which was kind of explicitly laid down because there was such suspicion, very understandably, after Park Chung-hee's uh, too-long rule and suspicions about Chun Doo Wan's intentions that we, we just, we want one term. But the result has been extreme, this is true in any democratic system, but extreme challenges of lame duckism, right, and of weakening presidency. And at the same time, as has been pointed out, a very powerful presidency. The National Assembly has not developed to play the kind of role that seems to be envisioned in the Constitution or that you do see in other democracies. 
Uh, I think there has been a lot more development in the area of rule of law, although, again, as we hear, there's probably a long way to go, and we could go down the list. But I think it's some of the institutionalization of it that, um, I mean, going back to, I'm glad to hear someone else, Bruce, your, your lecture was so good, I have to keep referring to it, but, but, but mentioning uh, um, uh, Gregory Henderson, <laughs> probably was the only one who would mention him again, this, this notion of Korean political culture, this goes back, you know, 100 years probably, but, you know, of a very atomized, uh, political system without uh, a very factionalized uh, and therefore in that environment very difficult to develop political parties, very difficult to develop you know, intermediate uh, sort of interests. Uh, hence the emphasis, for example, now on local autonomy, uh, which I think remains an area that, that, that all sides of the political spectrum agree needs, if you like, more, more substance, more development, uh, and, uh, and more development, if you like, of, of again, I say this all modesty in our current political situation here, of, of political parties that are rooted in more than uh, personalities. And my final point, I know I'm ta talking too long. I told you I get wound up about this. I, when I look on, uh, on Korea's extraordinary achievements, including in its democracy since 1987, the one thing that really saddens me, and I, I have to say a wonderful presentation from the last speaker kind of reminded me of this, is... is <laughs> Um, no Korean president, or for that matter, pre-1987, but no Korean president, uh, uh, democratically elected, you know, since 1987, has been able to leave office and finish his, or I guess in this case, maybe her life uh, in, in dignity. Now, I, you know, I, I certainly understand that there were strong reasons, and I don't want to relit litigate or relitigate. I'm not... For, but there were strong reasons for the reasons they, that has not happened and did not happen. But I think it is a, a, a danger, if you like, in, in, in Korean democracy uh, of, of a kind of cycle of continual kind of uh, uh, retribution. And, I, I, and this, again, it's very difficult as an outsider to talk about this, but I think it, one has to think about both it being proportional and about the impact of that sort of cycle on the overall health of the democracy. I'm old enough, you know, almost, but to remember when Nixon pardoned Ford. I cannot tell you how, people, how angry people were about that. And you'll still find people rightly debate it. But the argument for doing it was, in a way, for like the health of our democracy and our ability to move forward. When I um, would talk about um democratic transitions in um, my position in Warsaw, because Warsaw was very active in wanting to uh, promote uh, good governance and democratic transition in their own neighborhood in places like uh, Belarus and the Caucasus. But there was, uh, or when I was in a mood where I felt like I needed to praise <laughs> the country in which I found myself, I would talk about the demo democratic transitions during this period, and that among the, the leading examples of positive ones were South Africa, mm -hmm. South Korea, and I would, I would put Poland in that category as the leading examples of positive mm -hmm. transitions, notwithstanding the fact that in e each of these societies there are challenges, mm -hmm. just as you were saying. Well, a subtext, or maybe not so sub, that has uh, been um, talked about um, over the course of the day uh, is about the appropriateness or the impact of the United States in uh, supporting or not, as the case may be, and depending on perspectives, a democratization uh, in, in Korea. And we've had some uh, 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 conversation about President Carter, who campaigned on a policy of inserting human rights uh, as part of the, the, uh, a mainstream element of uh, uh, US foreign policy, and the degree to which that was pursued with fidelity and consistency. Uh, and. Um, and to what effect, and in particular today in, in South Korea. Um, I know not, not approaching this as a historian, but as a close observer, and as we discussed um, over lunch, as someone who was in the country when President Carter was elected, I'm curious if you have some thoughts about that, and also just more broadly, uh, maybe leading up to the June 1989 declaration as well, uh, uh, how you would evaluate um, the U.S. role. Okay, well, thank you. I, I realize I didn't actually answer your last question, even though I talked for about five minutes. So if I can just say you, you did ask, and I, and I think it's a really insightful point, a point to raise about uh, 
kind of the impact of, of South Korea's sort of economic uh, issues of inequality or other economic and social issues on the, the democratic or the political uh, upheavals. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, again, I'd be interested in some, some of you have spent more time in Korea recently than I have, uh, what, your, what your thoughts are, but uh, uh, I, walking around in those uh, beautiful crowds on those lovely fall nights and, and a few other times when I had a chance to be in Korea and from what I've seen over the last couple of years, um, young Koreans, I mean, whether they subscribe to the notion of hell chosun, uh, you know, Korea's hell or not, um, feel that Despite the fact, or maybe even because they grew up, you know, not remembering obviously the Korean War, not remembering when Korea was terribly poor, uh, uh, but and 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 having great opportunities in terms of that their parents really couldn't probably imagine in terms of education, including education abroad and so on and so forth. The competition has become so intense. It's the politics of the vortex again. Uh, that. Um, Life is kind of hell for a lot of students, that um, for and for a lot of young people, and at the same time, as has happened in in really, I guess every other, almost every other developed uh, uh, economy, capitalist economy, is is uh, income inequality has grown, even as in Korea, clearly everyone is materially or almost everyone, you know, more more prosperous certainly than the past generation or so, equality has grown a great deal, uh, and there's a sense that upper mobility is no longer possible. And again, I love all the, the, both the satire and the irony that, that, that young people go at it with, but there's a pain in it too, a great pain, and you feel it when you talk to them. And I think that that also is going to be a part, rightly, of clearly the expectations upon President Moon and any future uh, political leader and on how politics and democracy go forward. Now, with respect to the U.S. role, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, really wind me up, I guess, about that. But I, I, I did think we started, for those of you who were this morning, uh, with, with a, uh, a useful and, and provocative, uh, stimulating, provocative, you usually say when you don't agree with it, but a stimulating overview. Um, and I do agree with many parts of it. I'm going to be, as you scholars understand, all I am is anecdotal. You know, I guess I can try to be analytical as well. But... Um, uh, but yeah, I was I was living in Korea when President Carter was uh, was elected. I actually remember a little TV in the uh, in the little Chinese restaurant where I was having my jajangmyeon for lunch, and uh, you know it announced that Carter had won. Uh, information was not you know didn't didn't spread as rapidly as it does now, and uh, I have to say the reaction this is in Chungcheong Namdo was uh, was horror because Carter had said he was going to withdraw all the, all the U.S. troops from Korea. And you know, maybe there were some people somewhere who thought that was a good idea, but I have to say it worried everyone I spoke to. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's true, yes, that, that Carter, and I think we see this in, in a number of memoirs and so on, was talked out of this uh, by essentially all of his advisors. Now, with respect to the US role in 79, 80, um, rather than go into great detail on that, and, and, uh, but I appreciate that this was uh, discussed so thoughtfully this morning, uh, I would recommend those, uh, a memoir uh, by a predecessor of mine, William Gleisting, who was ambassador at that time, uh, from the time of Carter's election. So kind of in that limousine that stopped while, while President Carter yelled at all of them after his meeting with Park Chung-hee, through the, uh, uh, the coup d'etat by Chen Duan and the, uh, the Kwangju uprising. And just the title of his book suggests, I think, how painful this is, uh, was for him. And again, it's his account. So you scholars, you can take a lot of accounts, but his account, and it's called, uh, you know, the U.S. in Korea, uh, Massive Entanglement, Marginal Influence. <laughs> Maybe we felt that way in some other countries sometimes, too. And the other, um, the other thing I would recommend to you, I won't say anything more about that, that I would recommend uh, on the issue of Kwangju, which is raised this morning, is the, uh, the, the State Department's uh, report on Kwangju, which was written, I mean, sadly, I'm sorry to say it was not in, in 1980 or 1981 or 1982, it was 1989. So, you know, sometimes things, these things are a little late. Uh, I'm sure that many who have read it or will read it would find it incomplete or would not agree with some of the findings. But I mention it, one, because I think that um, it's a historically important document. And secondly, I think it illustrates another point that was made this morning about reconciliation and, and the role that, you know, trying to have a conversation, even if one doesn't come to a complete agreement about what happened historically or what the correct historical narrative is, 
or even sometimes what the facts are. Um, we try to have our, we try to share facts. Um, the fact that the U.S. wrote this report is important, and the fact that it only wrote this report and released it after June 1987 also, I think, illustrates the other point I want to make, which is democratization was a sine qua non of beginning a process of reconciliation, and also, in my view, of having a more mature and approved U.S.-South Korean relationship. Now, you'll still meet a few people, they're getting pretty old now, who might say, oh, you used to be so great, you know, before there's all this anti-Americanism and people this and that. No, and I think we heard some reasons why that's not the case. Uh, but a lot of this only kind of came out and we could talk about it after 1987. And sometimes, frankly, it's been very difficult for the U.S. government. Because not everything was done exactly the way we would have liked. And also, there's going to be some serious disagreement about when, when the issues were balanced, what the decision was. But I think that process has been essential to building the kind of much more resilient uh, and deep relationship which uh, we have now, which I certainly think we, we have now. So I think that's been uh, a great benefit. Now, I haven't even gotten, again, to your question, which is what, to me, was, is the 1980s. And I got there as a, as I said, as a political officer and followed this for, for, for several years. Uh, but here's what I'd say overall in terms of the analysis that I come away with, and, I, and that is, well, I mean, first of all, you know, we had a, we had a, a transfer of power ourselves, right? And that's, that's important. That, that affects a lot of things in terms of our North Korea policy, too. Carter was defeated by Reagan. This happened in 1980, for those of you who don't remember, and then Reagan took power in 1981. Well, Reagan took a different approach to South Korea. He, um, uh, he, he, he felt that Carter's approach had failed, and I guess that's maybe one thing everybody would agree on, it failed, right? Um, and he did a number of things that were highly controversial and that I heard about every single day, along with what the U.S. did or didn't do in Gwangju when I arrived as a, a very kind of well, wet behind the ears a political officer in 1983. Uh, he invited Chun Doo Wan to come to the White House as the first uh, official visitor. Why did he do it? As I told pro literally probably thousands of Koreans and young Koreans I met in the 80s, uh, it was a deal. It was an exchange for Kim Dae-jung's life. His death sentence, his totally, on totally trumped up charges, was, was, was lifted, and he, he went off to Harvard for a few years of exile until Bruce brought him back, see? But, um, so you can argue about whether, you know, whether he should have done that. I mean, not tried to save Kim dae jungs life. I think we can all agree that was important, and US, the U.S. did use his influence, but whether or not he needed to invite Chun. And we paid a price. We, the United States, paid a price in Korean public opinion for years afterwards because there was a controlled press there. Our story didn't get out of what the deal was. What got out was this picture of the, of, of, of the, the Chun couple and the uh, Reagans, you know, smiling and laughing on the, uh, the, the, the balcony, right? Um, but during those years, and here's where I have to disagree a little bit with Bruce, I was, I was there from 83 to 89, and uh, I obviously don't look Korean. There weren't many foreigners there. I, I mean, the U.S. Embassy was not an attractive building then, nor is it now, but it was actually a lot easier to get into and out of than it is now. That says something else that we won't have to talk about here. But, uh, and my job was to be out there. And I have to say, uh, you know, Koreans include, I, I, I didn't go to the foreign ministry. I, I, I went to the campuses. I went to I, uh, the labor unions, including the controlled labor unions. But I talked to anybody who would talk to me. And most people did want to talk to me. I mean, I, I acknowledge some probably didn't. But most wanted to kind of make their case to the American, if you like, even if she was a fairly junior American. And to say why they felt that the U.S. should apologize for Kwangju why the policy was wrong. And so I had to work pretty hard, those of you think, to kind of think, well, first I'm representing my government, but I have to have you know, something that I think is, is credible anyway and, and have a conversation. So I had conversations with lots of people. And what the Reagan administration did, frankly, somewhat to my surprise, but I like to think it was partly because of the reporting that was coming from the embassy and because Jim Willie came out. And, and not just because, I don't think, I never heard anybody say, oh my God, we think that you know, South Korea is going to collapse. It was, we saw the way things were moving. You know, we weren't that stupid. We were out there. People were out saying, this can't stand. We saw the election in 1985 when the opposition, despite having all the cards, if you like, stacked against it, did extremely well. Uh, we, we, we saw the, the desire by people, and I have to say, including in the government, to say, I think we should have an election. Chun Doo Wan stepping down is not enough. We want to actually have a real election. 
And they had the Olympics coming. Nobody's mentioned the Olympics. It's not always all about the US. But I think for the US, what we did is we did try to use I mean, our, our security uh, uh, support as well to ensure that the Olympics could be held in Seoul in a way that the Soviets and the Chinese and the Poles and Hungarians and all these countries with which, by the way, South Korea didn't have relations, could come to the Olympics. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, that this, this, this process of political uh, opening could continue. But the pace and the outcome of that process was clearly driven by the people themselves. But I think that there were enough people, maybe by 1985, 86, people still remembered 7980. And there were some conscious efforts to avoid the mistakes that were made then. Now, maybe you don't hear people saying publicly, yeah, we messed up back then. We're going to do something different now. But we tried something different. And one thing, for example, is okay, Carter was about human rights. But when we learned, and I can tell you after all these years, I mean, some of the ways we learned, it wasn't some high-tech, spooky way. We had contacts. Who, who, we, we learned. I mean, I, I knew from my own exper experience in South Korea earlier that uh, uh, physical force, corporal punishment, and torture, essentially, was, was not unknown in the, in the Korean system. And when we learned that, that students had been tortured, well, we knew they'd been tortured, uh, but that there had been deaths, we spoke out publicly about it. We had George Schultz, our Secretary of State, come, I'll never forget this. This was what made me think my career was worthwhile, not because I did it, but because I, uh, you know, whatever my disagreements might have been, we could do more, we could do less, whether it's here, there, wherever. He stood there and he said, you never torture. There's never an excuse for torture. You may think this is a North Korean spy. You know, you can't torture people. And it broke my heart decades later when we lost the moral high ground on that. That made a difference. It made a difference when our Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Affairs, a man named Gaston Seeger, made a speech in New York. And he called for the civilianization of uh, Korean politics. Now, I think the American audience, the sophisticated audience, you know, probably just did a big yawn. Well, not all of them. That was like a thunderclap in Korea. I had dozens of conversations with Koreans, both in the government and out of the government, said the students, the conservatives, about what does civilianization mean? Well, they kind of knew what it meant. You know, it was a, it was a kind of a, 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 a warning shot, if you like, to the, uh, to the military that, you know, we're not prepared to see, to see the military intervene again. That was effective. Was it, was it sufficient? Did the US make this happen? No. But I think it was an important contributor, along with the Olympics, uh, along with a very clear agenda on the part of uh, the Koreans, and, and, uh, and that these things came together to, um, to allow this, this moment that came when June 29th, I could give you more details, but when June 29th, when uh, the declaration was made that um, uh, the government was going to go forward with a direct election of the president, and they never looked back. All right. I, I would like to leave as much time for questions as possible, but Body I Mondo. also feel, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm just um, resisting the temptation to ask you more about this period, but I know uh, my colleagues in the audience will. But since you're here, and um, notwithstanding the subject matter uh, of today's conference, or maybe not entirely unconnected either, I feel we have to s take advantage benefit from your presence here to talk just briefly about um, the situation um, and the tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Mm. And I just might start with the most basic question, which is um, um, how serious, in your judgment, um, is the situation? How, how grave are the uh, tensions between uh, the North and the United States and, and uh, regionally? Well, I think it is serious, and I am concerned about it. And that is in the context of you know, knowing that we've had you know, periods of great tension and periods of escalation and management of some of you generally of those tensions uh, over the last you know, 65 years since, uh, uh, since, since the armistice in 1953. Uh, but I think it's more serious now for, well, maybe two primary reasons. One, obviously, uh, is the... Uh, uh, clear uh, resolve of, uh, of Kim Jong-un uh, as the leader of North Korea to consolidate uh, a nuclear weapon uh, and missile capability uh, that includes uh, the, the ability to, uh, to reach across the Pacific. Uh, so this, this does heighten tensions with the United States. 
And the second reason is, frankly, I can say this because I'm out of government now, is we have a, 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 a president uh, in Washington um, who I think, it, to put it as my, has risen to the bait. Uh, and I do think that this, um, this kind of rhetorical escalation that's gone on has uh, created uh, more risk, not less. I do think, I, my, my own sense is that neither, you know, uh, as much as I can tell, uh, Pyongyang or Washington are looking for an armed conflict. But a lot of armed conflict doesn't happen because one intentionally seeks it. It happens out of miscalculation, misunderstanding, escalation. And I think that's the greatest immediate danger. Uh, more long term, uh, the, you know, the North Korean nuclear program and the, the stated aims of, of the leadership of the DPRK remains a threat. I mean, not just to the United States, but clearly our, our political sh leadership feels it must obviously take that heavily into account, but also to the region. Uh, so, so we are in a difficult period, and I think we're going to have to, you know, really, uh, to think about our, our experience in, your sense, uh, in deterrence, in clarity of, of intent, uh, in containment, uh, in, uh, in demonstrating, uh, and this is the other area that concerns me a lot, commitment to our allies, the Republic of Korea and Japan. Uh, and then within that context, to try to, one, <laughs> get a diplomatic process going. I don't think it's impossible, but I think it has to come from the basis of, to quote the uh, statesman of, for whom I'm a fellow, William J. Perry, who famously said, and he was involved in North Korea uh, negotiations in the late 90s, uh, uh, we must deal with North Korea as it is, not as we would wish it, we wish it would be. You know, I wish we could roll back the clock and we can pick a number of years. Well, we can't. They are where they are now, and we need to deal with that. But the other thing that, that worries me that's get, gotten lost, uh, not at this conference, but gotten lost in the focus, which is, is I think, greater than I can ever remember, I don't, uh, in the United States, you know, the polls, North Korea is our biggest security challenge, was gotten lost on the path to a permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula has to be through, you know, addressing the fundamental you know, tragedy and, and issues of the Korean Peninsula, its division, uh, the absence of reconciliation, the, the you know, and, and without that, if we see it purely as a non-proliferation, which it is, uh, nuclear issue, we're not gonna get there. So we need to have both those things, I think, in play. That's super interesting, and also the subject of another hour and a half or longer. Uh, and I think some of those discussions will come out. But let me, uh, it's, um, it's just about five o'clock. We have uh, about a half hour. So what I'd like to do is uh, open the floor uh, to questions. Uh, we have colleagues who will pass uh, microphones around uh, as uh, you've been doing before. Uh, just, just say who you are uh, and um, if, you're, if you're a student or member of the faculty, what, what faculty, what a department or unit you're in or would like to identify with. Um, and um, we'll take it from there. Um, so please um, uh, let us know who'd like to ask a question. Just raise your hand. Thank you, Ambassador Stevens. Um, my name is Youngju Ryu, and I'm uh, I teach Korean literature at the University of Michigan. So um, I think, in my own experience, one of the enduring themes of South Korean critique of American foreign policy uh, in Korea, uh, especially from the South Korean left, is sort of American foreign policy's failure to, uh, or underestimation of the project of decolonization in Korea. Mm. And that's something that started in 1945, mm. and for a lot of uh, America's critics, it's something that continues today. Mm -hmm. So one of the charges that would continue to rankle, I think, Korean, South Korean left, is the perception that Japan is an independent variable where American foreign policy is concerned, and Korea is a dependent variable to that independent variable. I've heard that said a number of times in a number of different 
venues. And so I was wondering, I mean, and, and that reflects this feeling um, of, I mean, most recently, the number of days Trump oh. is going to spend in Japan as yeah. opposed to in Korea mm -hmm. sparked a kind of an internet discussion on this. And it's a continued iteration of that very old theme about decolonization, and that America is underestimating the desire and, and challenge of decolonization in South Korea. Oh. So I'm wondering if you can uh -huh. maybe, I mean, is that, is, is that an uh, incorrect perception, or is that unfounded charge on the, on the, uh, in terms of the critique of American policy in South Korea, or? Yeah, I mean, I certainly, it, to the extent that I can uh, conceive it, I, 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 I don't uh, see, I don't think that there is a U.S. conception, I've never felt it or heard it, I can't, that, that somehow South Korea is, or as you say, a dependent variable of the independent variable of Japan. Maybe I, I just, I don't, I don't get it, I'm not scholarly enough, but, but I, I don't get that. Um, I, the, the U.S., policy establishment uh, on a bipartisan basis um, ac across administrations uh, has, as part of the post-World War II, you know, U.S.-led order, which may be changing. We are in a changing time, but we, uh, has attached great importance to a security relationship with Japan. Uh, now, it's changed over the years. We have the rise of China, which creates, obviously, so, uh, but there's that. And then when it comes to Korea, I think it's kind of a different story to tell. So I, I, I don't see those two as somehow related to colonization. I really don't. Um, and in fact, I mean, I, I hesitate, and I'm not going to get to it, getting into kind of which alliance is better, you know, of, of, or where are the relationships better. But I mean, I would, you know, one thing that really strikes me about my own, you know, connection with Korea over the last 40 years is, is how, by so many measures, and I mean, the, the, the U.S.-Korea relationship has become so much broader and deeper. And the U.S.-Japan relationship um, is a bit um, brittle. I, I hope I'm not quoted on that, but it doesn't matter anymore, you know. Um, uh, and, and it's even things like students, you know, all this, 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 the South Korean students who come to the United States. The Japanese don't come anymore. I think you probably, I don't know if you find That's that correct. here, but That's it's, it's the, the flowering of, of Korean studies programs here, the, uh, the, the, the soft power of K-pop, the, the, I mean, the kinds of things you were talking about, this kind of political culture. We, I, I just think at this kind of more organic level, I guess if I can call it that, the connections are much deeper. And I say that a little sadly, because I'd like to see more of that with Japan, myself, both in terms of our national interests and just personally but it's not quite there. So I, I actually, in that way, kind of worry a little bit more about, about the, 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 the U.S.-Japan relationship and where Japan is headed. Uh, but no, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't see the, um, now, I mean, what I think you're well aware of, and I know what irritates um, Koreans, I think, from across the political spectrum, is a sense that sometimes the U.S. is trying way too hard well, I mean, one, not trying hard enough to acknowledge its own and I, uh, kind of role in, in, in the, the roots of some of these historical uh, pains and disputes, and two, uh, trying a little bit too hard to say, um, let's have a trilateral relationship, you know, and let's do things together, and pushing that where the Korean body politic doesn't want to go, and I think that's true on the left and the right. So. And, that, and that does irritate, I would say, U.S. policymakers um, often, and, and not me. <laughs> And the politics of trips is a whole other. And the politics uh, of trips, yeah, yes. we could all talk about the politics Who goes of trips. Where yeah, yeah. first and in what yeah. order is always uh, is yeah. always a factor. I heard the Japanese were upset too because he's not spending enough night time in Japan and too much time followed this and you know too much in China and yeah yeah. Uh, <laughs> woman in right, right there, yes. Hello, my name is Kimber Garland. I'm a sophomore at Indiana University. Um, I'm a part of a club called Liberty in North Korea. We raise awareness about the human rights violations occurring in North Korea. Um, the United Nations Security Councils have put sanctions on North Korea, which have affected the operations of human rights organizations in North Korea. I was wondering, what is your perspective on the human rights violations occurring in North Korea and the organizations operating there? Well, I, I mean, my, my perspective on, on the, well, the, the human rights and, and overall situation in North Korea is that uh, 
20, 25 million people of North Korea uh, are, are long-suffering people who I would like to see have the same kind of opportunities and, and, and rights that, well, that even people in China have. I, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, clearly a very dire situation uh, by, by any measure. I think that the uh, attention that has been brought to bear has been uh, important and, and, and often useful in allowing, I think, publics, both in South Korea and more broadly, to see North Korea as more than a, certainly in the United States, as more than a one-dimensional issue. It's not just about the nuclear weapons. You know, we need to, we need to think and care about the people of North Korea. Um, I mean, I have to say the, the obvious, and it's not a criticism of the organizations, that to date, uh, you know, we, I guess the outside world, have not been successful in whatever approach we've taken in, in, in improving uh, the human rights situation. And that's, again, where you get into debate about the diplomatic, you know, approach and, and what you can do, you know, engagement versus pressure and all the rest of it. I think it's got to be a combination. I think we have to keep working on it, but I think we do have to keep, you know, first and foremost in our mind that these are human beings um, who, uh, uh, <laughs> through no fault of their own, uh, are part of a, a continued, uh, you know, divided peninsula and uh, who uh, need to have a better future and we need to think about it in that light. We should have a better future. We got a microphone Get a coming microphone, for you. That's right. <laughs> now, when you speak here, that your your voice comes up like this, you know. So. <laughs> uh, it's nice to see you again. You probably wonder where we ran across each other. That was uh, around 2012 when I accompanied President McGrabby from IU oh, and Entourage, we visited your office, and uh, that's my first encounter with you. Yeah. But be that aside, I'm a professor emeritus in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs. I also currently carry a title, Special Advisor to the IU President on Global Partnerships. Mm -hmm. My question is this. I think that apart from the current issues, have you sensed the, uh, anything about the Korean history being written, rewritten, yes. some, somehow, somehow regarded as a revisionist view of it, and then the other ideological perspective comes in, they tend to rewrite it? Or is it something just the uh, academe people talk about? Um. Yeah, I'm certainly well aware, and it was discussed a bit this morning that uh, it, it was, in, in, in South Korea, uh, an issue that went far beyond uh, just the uh, academy uh, in terms of one of the most controversial things under the previous administration of trying to, uh, 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 to, to I guess, nationalize or, or make uniform the, uh, the, the history textbooks. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's... It's going to continue to be an issue, and we, we talked about this morning mostly in terms of uh, in, with the debate within South Korea. Uh, there is, of course, also the, uh, uh, the conversation or lack of thereof, I guess, between and, and, and differing narratives uh, between Japan, South Korea, and China. And I, I, I guess I'd say I, I welcome, as a kind of former bureaucrat, not a historian, but I think anyone, we all have to think about history, I welcome any efforts by scholars to try to, um, I mean, it's not to talk to each other and, and to find, I mean, it's at least some, some common ground and some, some common facts. But I guess I'd say, and this is very much, and maybe you share it from an American perspective, uh, I am just personally uh, suspicious of, an, of, of, of some sort of a, a, nationalized uh, uh, imposition of, of a certain uh, text. But uh, no, I know this is a very uh, live issue and I've heard people, well, people, you know, as someone was saying this morning, I mean, people get very passionate, which I love. I mean, see, I have a little bit of it too in Korea about just about everything, but, uh, uh, but very passionate about, uh, about the textbook issue. I worry about in China. 
You know, I, I talk to quite a few Chinese groups um, that, that come to Stanford and I talk to them about Korea and their perceptions and, you know, we, I worry about the U.S. for that matter too. You know, I remember years ago reading a, a, it was a series of essays actually by a writer, I think it was Frances Fitzgerald, maybe it was her, anyway, uh, by, called America Revised. You know, America knows this too. I mean, if you read American history books over a century or so, I shouldn't be saying this in the, in the company of real historians. Uh, you know, we've totally changed our history, but it is more, even more, I think, salient, although, well, now I can't even say that because we're really, we, we, we are relitigating the Civil War here, practically, so, yes. so I don't know. I, don't, <laughs> I, I, I do try to think about the experience in Asia when I think about things like the debates and, and more. We've seen surrounding statues in this country, right? And other symbols. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, I'm Priscilla Stevens. Uh, my name is Kelly Kang. I'm uh, first from South Korea, and I'm a student at um, Indiana Law School here, uh, studying transitional justice after possible reunification of two Korea. Wow. And um, we South Korean knows you uh, more um, as uh, like Ambassador Sim Eun Kyung. <laughs> so I really greatly uh, appreciate your service in South Korea and your love towards South Korea. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh. And um, my question is, um, now South Korea, um, um, talking about this burst between um, North Korea and US and impossible um, disaster in South Korea. So um, it's not South Koreans are not worried about this situation, but um, we more feel helplessness uh, in this situation because um, how much South Korean government can add voices um, to um, shaping um, U.S. policy toward this Korean peninsula. So um, I was wondering what's your opinion about this? Um, and actually, South Korean um, saw this situation as like Korean passing. So Korea is um, ex um, outside of this whole conversation and has a no room inside here. So yeah, that's my question. Yeah, I, I've heard of this concern, and, and, and frankly, I, you know, I share it. Uh, I, I actually, when I came halfway across, I was in Washington. Not that I have much influence, but I was in Washington the last couple of days, and I have no influence, actually. But I think this is, this is the kind of uh, uh, point that I was um, trying to underscore. If we try to think about the lessons, I would put it this way, um, the lessons I think we can learn from looking at um, our to-date failed efforts to have a positive outcome to engagement with, uh, uh, with Pyongyang to you know, move forward. Um, and we could go through all the periods, our, our presidents, your president, sometimes, you know, as at our elections change these things too. Um, the only time when we've made, in my view, I say, the only time, we, we've, the only time we've, we've made some progress, at least for a while, is pretty much, I think, when Seoul and Washington were able to work together. Now, it didn't mean that behind the scenes we weren't sometimes fiercely debating and pressuring, but where we, we spoke with one voice. And uh, I, I think we need to do that now. I think that's a very important lesson. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of the obvious thing to do, uh, but I think we need to remind uh, uh, the current administration in Washington uh, of the uh, importance <laughs> on, on every level of our alliance uh, with the Republic of Korea and also about the fact this is uh, this is the country that is most impacted in every way uh, by steps that we that the U.S. administration may, may may take, and I'm not just talking about military ones. I have to say, I also a little bit disturbed when I more than a little bit disturbed when I read, you know, there's a lot of op-ed pieces now in American papers by a whole lot of people. That's good, I guess, about you know what to do about Korea, what to do about Korea, and. and um, you know, some will kind of take the approach, especially if they don't have much background in the region, and say, well, you know, the U.S. and China, they can just work something out, right? Um, you know, I would hope we would have learned from our own history, not only in the region, but elsewhere in the world, that doesn't work out so well. Uh, so I think it's a very important point that I, I, I hope that, that South Korean leaders and, and opinion shapers will make. Uh, and I will continue to make myself. I also have to tell you, though, about my name, Shimon Gyeong, that I never intended, because people say to use a Korean name as ambassador, but this is just a warning to all of you. It's probably, well, the digital age, you know this, but when my name was announced to be uh, ambassador to South Korea, you know, I see the whole, this is in 2008, um, 
you know, uh, everyone's like, who? You know, and those 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 uh, those Korean reporters, they went down to Daejeon and Chungcheon Namdo and looked through all the old files, and they found this this little piece of paper I'd filled out in 1975 when I had only studied Korean for about a month. But I'd been given a Korean name, so where it said your name, you know, I'd written it in this really, as you Chihan, you know, this really childish script. And so the headline the next day was not, oh, she did this or she did that with the Clinton administration. It was her name. She has a Korean name, and it's, <laughs> and I never. I, I mean, I'm honored by it. I'm honored by it. But I, after that, it was like that's all people knew. <laughs> that's an excellent start, though, to your, to your <laughs> tenure for sure. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for coming, by the way. My name is Olivia Goad. I'm a student at IU, and I'm studying international diplomacy. Um, my question is, how do you think that the tensions on the Korean Peninsula are affecting neighboring countries, specifically China and Japan? Yeah. Um, well, first, with respect to Japan, uh, and I draw this, honestly, mostly from press reports and <laughs> a little anecdotal, but uh, talking to people. Uh, I think there is an, a, a genuine nervousness on the part of the Japanese public uh, when they see these, these missile tests uh, uh, go, fly over Japan. Uh, I agree with the view that uh, uh, this sense of increased tensions with, with Japan uh, uh, provided a... Uh, perhaps a, a one among several justifications for Prime Minister Abe to decide to uh, call an election rather unexpectedly, which I think is going to happen this weekend, uh, that he uh, it, it uses the, uh, and I don't mean use in the sense it doesn't exist, obviously it does, but he uses the, uh, the increased uh, uh, threats from, from North Korea to uh, push forward uh, with his uh, efforts to to lift many of the, uh, the restrictions of uh, the, the constitutional uh, restrictions in Japan on Japan uh, uh, increasing its military role. And, and that he, it, this gives him some space to do it despite the fact that public polling, public opinion polling in Japan shows that the, the, probably the majority of the Japanese public remain quite um, uh, opposed or uh, at least very uh, uh, ambiguous, uh, very nervous about, uh, about doing that. Um, you know, with respect to China, I, I think we should, well, I, I mean, we can say some of the obvious things. Uh, I, Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership I, doesn't make much of a secret of its uh, disdain and uh, uh, for Kim Jong-un. Uh, I think the China-DPRK relationship is probably at about its... Uh, you know, lowest level in, in, in quite a while. Again, I looked at the historians for maybe a more informed view. Uh, China is, you know, participating in the sort of increasing sanctions, but I don't, I, um, that conventional view that they won't do it to the point of, of really threatening the survival uh, of the regime. Somewhat ironically, I sometimes think that uh, Chinese economic pressure on South Korea has somehow been more effective than, China, than Chinese economic pressure on North Korea, but that's, you know, that's another sad story, I guess. Um, but it's also interesting to me that I just that Xi Jinping now you had their party congress going on right now, and I guess he gave a you know a four hour speech yesterday, um, with lots lots of applause, <laughs> um, and he didn't mention Korea. He didn't mention Korea. It's interesting. So, but yeah, I, I think it's it's uh, uh, the North Korean threat is is an annoyance. Uh, but I, I don't know. You know, may, maybe Xi Jinping. You know, we, he's he's building, or he, well, I don't know. He's, he's trying to figure out how to manage his relationship with Trump, where that fits in. Uh, I think it's and and also the relationship with North with with South Korea. You know, one would one would if you the really big right sort of modern. Sino-Korean relationship is really between the ROK and, 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 and Beijing, if you measure it by economic ties or by any traditional measures. But, you know, there's this, this, this issue of, of North Korea and, and how China, what China views as the alternatives to the status quo. And right now, I think they, they haven't thought of an alternative status quo that's better than the kind of, kind of mess that it's in now. Um, first, thank you so much for all of the thoughts that you have shared with us. It's been really insightful. Um, my name is Zoe. I am a student here at IU in the Korean department. Um, 
You had mentioned earlier with each of your subsequent trips back to Korea, you had returned to a Korea that had been significantly changed um, from when you had been previously there. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are with the recent administration changes over the last year, if you think that this could provide kind of a springboard for Korea to address its issues um, and kind of modify the issues that there are still with democratization that we've talked about so far in this panel, or if this is um, more of just kind of a road bump along the way and there, um, will things will continue to stay mostly the same? Yeah, uh, well, I, I mean, thank you for that question. I mean, I, I, I hope it's the first. And I hope that, uh, that Moon Jae-in, who continues to enjoy uh, a very healthy uh, uh, s public opinion uh, support, you know, he probably shouldn't tell President Trump about that, it might be, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, is, uh, there are a lot of expectations on him. Uh, but people are giving a little time to, to, to meet them, and, uh, and I, I, I have, as you can probably tell, I, I have a lot of admiration for the, the talents. We've, we've told us in some ways where the you know, negative stories sometimes where the problems are today, but I mean, I have a lot of, a lot of confidence in the commitment and the talent of, uh, of people from across the political spectrum in South Korea, and I think Moon Jae-in has a good opportunity here. That said, as we've already talked about, the political system you know, has its issues. Uh, and, uh, uh, but this is a moment, this is a moment, and I agree with the comment that next year the local elections will be very important to see, to see how those go. And I also think, without, I, I also think it will be important to see, you know, how, and I, I'm not trying to prejudge the outcome or even what it should be, but, but, you know, Lee myung Park Geun-hye, you know, how that all plays out. Uh, and however it does, I think, it, I, I hope it's with a sense that, as, as there has been to this point, that, the rule of laws prevail, that there hasn't been, that is not a, a, a system of political retribution, and that, you know, we diplomats, we're born to be kind of in the middle, and, and, and that there can be a sense that, which I mean, that, that you can kind of grow the middle. Um, I, I rather, and this is where I, I guess I differ from practically everybody else who talks about Korea or Korean politics, I've always kind of felt like there was, there was more commonality on the political spectrum than you would sometimes think. And I say that, I, in a way, from my, again, from my own experience and the U.S.'s own experience of working with a, a variety of, of different uh, of Korean leaders. Um, you know, Noam Yeun, well, one, Kim Dae-jung, we're talking about the progressive wing now, Kim Dae-jung was a great friend of the United States. Uh, and I think that uh, he and President Clinton, and you know this well, uh, Madeleine Albright worked very, very closely together. I was actually ambassador when Kim Dae-jung passed away, and we had this wonderful gathering of people, former ambassadors and secretaries of state who came to pay their respects. Noam Hyun created a little bit more anxiety, but in fact, it was under Noam Hyun's presidency that the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement was, was agreed to. That Noam Hyun uh, supported, I mean, an effort which I personally and I think many of us w w didn't support, but, but the effort, the, the U.S. effort in Iraq was the third largest contingent of troops after the U.S. and the British. Um, where, so I, I say all that to say I think any Korean president from whatever part of the political spectrum is, is going to have several kind of must-dos, you know, kind of, kind of prime, prime directives, right? And, and one is to protect and defend the Republic of Korea, obviously, and, and another is to manage the relationship with the United States, certainly China too, but the, that, that alliance relationship remains such a pillar, and, and this could address the, the kind of roiling, I think, you know, aspirations and frustrations of a younger generation coming up. And that's where I think, I'm getting, now, where in some ways I think South Korean democracy and South Korean society is almost a little bit of a canary in the coal mine. Uh, okay, we don't have time to go into it here, nor do I have the expertise, but the role of social media, the emergence of all this dynamism, but also of all this um, uh, uh, stovepiping of news, of all this spreading of rumor, of all this, 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 this kind of, again, roiling, I guess is the word I'm going to use. I don't, I, I don't use the word fake news, so I'm not saying it, but I mean, just this, I, I just have that sense in it that Korea is kind of, living or figuring all this out too, as we are. The role of popular protest, you know, is what we saw, is that populism? Or is that something else? And what do we mean by that? So I think as Korea kind of, I'm op I, 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 want, I have to be optimistic, and then North Korea is gonna figure into this too, but, but, uh, but I think that there's a meaning uh, on, on how Korea addresses some of these issues that will be very important not only to Poland and other, if you like, what we think of as still, I guess, newer democracies, but also you know, to the United States. 
So uh, we, we need to uh, wrap up, but I wonder, uh, Kathleen, if I could um, uh, ask you to talk about something that we discussed um, just uh, before lunch, which was on the, the topic of, this, uh, of our conference on yeah. democratization. You talked about, uh, and, it, and it came up in Professor Cummings' presentation as yeah. well, the issue of um, historical grievances uh, versus looking ahead yeah. and, the, and the balance there. Uh, I found it very interesting. I wonder if yeah. you would share that with our colleagues here. Yeah, yeah. and I think we, we got into this conversation because both of us have also spent a good deal of time in you know, other parts of the world. Um, I spent uh, uh, <laughs> uh, a number of years uh, at different episodes uh, working on fracturing Yugoslavia and the Balkans. Um, I spent several years uh, heavily focused, three years living in Belfast. Um, so I've been a lot of places where history still reverberates and poisons and where there's very little agreement. And I mean, in all those places, again, do I, I'd say it's, you know, it's only when you have a democracy you can begin to address them. Um, but they, they are blockages. And, and one thing, one reason I have many, as you can kind of see, I was so happy to go back to Korea is because is my sense about Korea, and it still is, is that Notwithstanding the, the, the continued salience and intensity and pain of a lot of these historical issues that do need to be addressed, and my goodness, I mean, if we get into a process with North Korea, then we, we you know, the task becomes all, all, all the more essential and all the easier. But notwithstanding all that, I always found, you know, I'm not supposed to compare some people to other people, and, you know, but I always compared Japan and Korea, so, but, um, but I always found in Korea, there was also the sense of, we're doing all that, but we're still moving forward. We're still looking forward. And I have to say that other parts of the world where I've lived, there hasn't been that same capacity. And people have really gotten stuck. Uh, and of course, uh, I mean, in Yugoslavia, it led to a war, which I think was you know, preventable and necessary. And I think the US could have done more, but that's another issue. But, but they get really stuck. So, I, yeah, I, 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 was I was moved by the, by the discussion this morning, and I know it will continue, but I also, yeah, wanted to kind of express it, yeah, especially as we were talking about it, that, that I do admire the ability of Koreans to also realize, you know, we've got, yes, we want to we wanna sort of honor and remember our generations back, and I think that's one reason why, I mean, the continued division of the peninsula continues to be so painful. Uh, but also, uh, we've got to make things right for the next generation. And I think that's a great strength of, of the Korean people. That's a great way to end. Um, everybody, please join me in thanking Ambassador Stevens.